Howdy, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Miller, and I'm here with my friend and housemate and uh, intellectual sparring partner, Justin Murphy. Hello. And we're going to talk about Bronze Age pervert. Not just any Bronze Age pervert, but the Bronze Age pervert. And his book, Bronze Age Mindset, which we both read and enjoyed and think is very uh, provocative and also stylistically and kind of intellectually interesting. So, um, Justin, you've done a little bit of coverage already of Bronze Age pervert, BAP, as we like to call him, or BAPism. Um, who is he? Probably not she, possibly them. W what are some of the theories we have about who this anonymous edgelord kind of is? Well, I'm far from an expert on the question, but the reason you might be asking me that is because about a year ago or whenever BAP first came out with his book, and it made a bit of a splash. I was very intrigued by this character. And I looked into it a little bit. I tried to figure out who he was and tried to make, you know, heads or tails of it. And there are a bunch of theories. Different people say different things. People have actually sent me DMs over, over time telling me different accounts. Not quite sure which ones to believe. But I did do this three-part video series on YouTube trying to provide a theoretical account of who I think BAP is and... Obviously, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek if you watch it. I think you can tell that. But I think there is a kernel of truth in, in the thesis that I develop in those kind of conspiratainment videos. And the, the, the theory that I put forward anyway, and to this day, I think I remain quite convinced of this. The theory is that BAP is essentially a collective project. I think there are a few people working on it in one way or another, and that remains unclear exactly how. But I think... Time has actually bore this out. Now, it's complicated by the fact that recently BAP has presented himself in the public sphere as an, as an individual persona. He does a podcast now. He does some guesting on other people's podcasts. So there is a man with a thick accent who is BAP and speaks as BAP. And I see no reason to doubt that that is a you know key representative of the BAP project and perhaps even the author, the single author. I did toy with the possibility at, you know, a, a year ago or whenever it was that BAP's book came out, I did toy with the theory that it was collectively written, that maybe there was not even a, a single person. And I think the, the revelation that there is a guy out there with a thick accent who is speaking as BAP and can kind of represent the ideas in a way that seems, you know, reasonably faithful. I think uh, I've updated my views a little bit on on the belief that, yeah, there, there could be one, you know, guy out there who is who essentially wrote the book. But I still definitely believe that he is only the center of a kind of collective plot. I think, in other words, that BAP is a PSYOP. I think Curtis Yarvin, a.k.a. Mencius Moldbug, is in on it. I think Tara Burton is in on it. She's a author and, and, and columnist, writes mostly about religion. And I think there might be a few other players in on it. We can talk a little bit about the recent kind of publicity campaign that the BAP team has launched in uh, the American Mind magazine. To me, this is just additional vindication of my initial theory, frankly, that it is a kind of collective project. It's a kind of media psyop, and I think it's quite clever, frankly. I, I'm, I'm quite impressed by it, and that's why I've been intrigued uh, by the BAP project since, since it came out. So that's, that's my theory. There are many other accounts. The, probably the short, honest answer, Jeffrey, is that uh, no one is really certain who who BAP is or, or what's going on behind the scenes. It's it's quite mysterious, and I think that's part of its allure and, and part of the intrigue and interest behind it. So I guess one question that um, viewers might have or listeners might have is, why would an evolutionary psychologist and a political scientist take this book at all seriously? Like, what's the big deal? Um, some little backstory is this thing was published in June 2018. Um, it's about 200 pages. For some reason, it's number one currently in the Amazon list for ancient Greek history books, which is kind of a weird achievement. And it's got over 250 reviews on Amazon, which indicates it's probably selling pretty well. Um, 10 bucks on Kindle. And I think this is part of a kind of emerging ecosystem of alternative intellectual culture that includes... Some people on the far left, the alt-center, the, the sort of far right, the alt-right, but 
all of these terms are getting mixed up in very complicated ways, it seems like. And publishing anonymously, I think, is one way to get freedom. And freedom is a big theme in Bronze Age mindset or BAM. Freedom stylistically, freedom intellectually, freedom to say shit that nobody can say if they're not anonymous. I don't know how much uh, BAP or the BAP team would worry about getting doxxed for stuff like this, but we're going to try to respect their privacy to some degree, apart from sort of speculating about who's on, on the team. How do you think, though, Justin, that this fits in with your sort of vision of this emerging social media intellectual culture? Is it kind of breaking new ground in a way for what can be done, what can be communicated? That's a really good question. I, and I agree with you that I think that's kind of the main interest of, of the BAP project. It's what it represents in kind of the changing economy of publishing and the changing power distributions with respect to intellectual influence, for sure. Yeah. And I do think in a way that the success of the BAP book definitely updated some people's thinking and, and strategizing about where power really can be had through, you know, intellectual forms of, of discourse. And so some people might chuckle at intellectual because the book is, you know, it's funny. It's a lot of it is tongue in cheek. One gets the impression uh, it, it's written in this kind of poor grammar that seems to be part of the shtick, mm-hmm. but in part because of that, it's, it has this kind of fun freewheeling vibe to it. And so it's not particularly original or impressive in any kind of scholarly or intellectual way. Like it doesn't, it certainly doesn't break any type of new ground in terms of, you know, long run intellectual progress. Mm-hmm. It's mostly a kind of remix of, of Nietzschean ideas and a kind of, a kind of tantalizing male vitalism that I think is quite hard to find elsewhere. So it, it, it packages or repackages a number of really interesting things in a fun and interesting and cool way, for sure. I'm not throwing any shade on it. Just to be clear for people who maybe have no idea what we're talking about, it's not really trying to be uh, an impressive sort of intellectual advancement, I don't think. Yeah, this is not the next big 600-page Steven Pinker book that's right. like deeply researched and has a grand, coherent intellectual vision that tries to be um, pleasing to both expert scientists and kind of the intelligent lay reader, whatever that is. This is more like, I, I just rewatched uh, the movie Troy, right? And there's a, a bit where Achilles is about to attack the Trojan homeland with his Myrmidons, his soldiers. And he's like, glory is out there. It's waiting for you. Take it. My hair always stands on end when I hear Achilles say that. And I think this book is is supposed to be functioning as a bit of an inspirational exercise to sort of encourage all the other, you know, young edge lords to come out of the woodwork and do more stuff like this, and to kind of illustrate this is possible, and you can write something in a style where it's like, ain't got time for grammar, yeah, grammar is yeah. for nerds and wusses yeah. and scientists and petty intellectuals, and bug men and bug men and. <laughs> Uh, so right. yeah yeah so it's your initial question what though was why are two professional intellectuals and published academics who write scholarly journal articles uh, talking about this book and my answer to that personally is this is worth paying attention to and it's worth being interested in even from academics who do you know more traditional scholarly work or what have you because of what it represents as uh, as a moment in the changing distributions of power when it comes to uh you know, I'm just going to say intellectual influence, whether you think this is an intellectual project or not, uh, th- that's fine. You can debate that. But I definitely see it as in the intellectual domain, for sure. It's, it's, messing, it's messing with our expectations about what a book uh, is supposed to be or uh, yeah. what type of book is worth reading because that's, that's ultimately what is really interesting here. A lot of people are reading this book. And so if, if in, in, in just that regard alone, um, it's it, it it's worthy of attention and some consideration and and so I think that's probably why you and I are both interested in it right because it represents oh this is like people are moving away from the kind of traditional sources of endorsement right like there once upon a time nobody would read a book if it wasn't you know through one of the big five publishers or if it didn't have mm-hmm. some really famous person on the back of it endorsing it or something like that whereas now if you 
have your finger on the pulse of some sort of internet subculture and you're really genuinely kind of invested in, in that and, and expressing um, a, a relatively undersupplied sort of spirit that mm-hmm. is important and that people want and need, you can really make a, a major splash in political, in the political arena in, and even in the intellectual arena of, of, you know, respected, you know, scholars and writers or whatever. <clears throat> so that's, I think, what's interesting to me about it. Yeah, I was trying to imagine, like, if Bronze Age Pervert had done a traditional style book proposal, shopped it to a literary agent, literary agent tries to get double data, buy it and invest in it and market it and distribute it through Barnes and Nobles or whatever, it would just be ridiculous. And it, it sort of indicates the limits and, and almost the brokenness of that kind of mainstream publishing system. And I think, of course, Nietzsche did the same thing with philosophy. He published books that were completely unlike sort of mid 1800s, late 1800s philosophy works like Thus Spake Zarathustra or Ecce Homo that's highly kind of autobiographical. And it just broke the mold for what you could do in terms of philosophizing with a hammer. And I think this is sort of a a 21st century update of that kind of Nietzschean project for social media era when, you know, instead of intellectuals in Europe kind of writing letters longhand to each other saying you really have to read this Nietzsche guy he's he's genius now you do that at sort of a thousand times the speed and you can get this social media following really um quickly and and people are kind of people also the reader has the freedom to kind of engage with this sort of book I think the way that people kind of engage with a twitter feed uh you and I both commented reading this is a little bit like reading a Twitter stream, if you follow interesting, slightly unhinged people with grandiose ideas, but where like most of their ideas aren't very good and are somewhat derivative, but it's kind of a relaxing process. Like there's high variance in the quality of the observations here, but that actually makes for more gripping reading. I think if it was uniform genius all the way through start to finish, you'd get really bored really quickly. Yeah, we, that's right. We were talking about that before. The problem with like really, really rigorous academic books is you actually do have to pay attention to every word. You have to go slow and, 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 and it's quite a taxing process. And that's one of the reasons why people don't read academic books. But what's cool about doing a book like BAP does where it's it's sort of aggressively sloppy in, in a certain way. And it, and it's, it own, it's, it's reckless. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it owns that sloppiness. It's really disarming for the reader. It's fun. It's relaxed. If you, you know skip a few sentences, you're not going to really like lose any sleep over it because a lot of it is kind of nonsensical. And so this isn't, again, I'm not throwing shade. Like I, I, we're talking about the book. So obviously both you and I have a certain respect and admiration for it. You know, I think the bat project is very interesting and impressive, uh, especially in its kind of, uh, kind of rhetorical cleverness. And it's obvious, obviously it's, it's kind of political, it's political implications. So if I'm critical or it sounds like I'm kind of being snooty, like talking, talking about it, like an academic, you know, I'm I'm really not trying to throw shade. I'll just say that up front and I won't say it again. Yeah. So we, we are going to get to the content in, in a little bit, but, um, just to kind of hammer away at the style a little bit, there are some genuinely beautiful passages in here and amazing turns of phrase. And I wanted to read, I'll, I'll read a few as we sort of go through, but, um, here's one of my favorites. Um, Underneath the pervasiveness, let me hold this up so you guys can see it. Underneath the pervasiveness of the domestication and management of modern civilization, underneath its superficial orderliness, there remained the floating world, the free world as a still and dark ocean, in which moved monsters, including the lords and crafters of this new civilization. By which I think he means, you know, kind of the social media edge, edge lords and independent authors himself, but also everybody who's sort of on board with that project of trying to see through the existing delusions and, and taboos of our civilization. Yeah, I think he's explicitly channeling frog Twitter. He, it's sort of one of the first things that's, that's cited in, in the first few pages. For people who don't know, frog Twitter is essentially the kind of what is known as the alt-right or one of the main symbols of the alt-right, the kind of grassroots, organic, internet-based kind of rebellion against kind of mainstream conservatism that is often associated with, you know, the rise of Donald Trump. 
And so he's clearly channeling that. There's also a channeling of the kind of anti-globalism kind of kind of notion that that's at least how I re- I read it. I think that's kind of the sub the subtext there. He's 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 trying to kind of poke holes in in this perception, right, of a lot of status quo institutions being essentially filled with corruption and kind of people who are dead behind the eyes and who are essentially just fucking over the people, you know, the masses uh, for their own interests, right? From the left, this is called like yeah. the neoliberal order, right? So yeah. it has all these different names, but uh, that's definitely what he's targeting. I think actually the rhetoric has a lot in common with Trump's lack of polish. And and yeah, that's right. From this sort of um, BAP mindset or also the alt-right mindset or also the, the far left anarchists, anything polished is marketing. It's professional right, marketing right. of some sort. It's messaging. It's designed you don't trust to, it. to influence and you don't trust it. So um, you could read a book like Bronze Age Mindset and, and say, oh, it really needed a good copy editor. But that would entirely miss the point that the recklessness is the credibility here. And it's signaling, yeah, that it's it's not a manifesto. It's not Bronze Age manifesto. It's not Bronze Age theorem. It's not Bronze Age academic journal paper. It's Bronze Age mindset. It's trying to convey a way of perceiving and thinking about the world and acting in it that is revolutionary, purpose-driven, teleological, not just to get tenure and not just to sell shit to people yeah that's well put do you think it would be worthwhile to just kind of summarize the 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 book's message do you do you want to take a stab at that yeah i think there's a lot in it that kind of hinges on nietzsche's uh genealogy of morals christian versus pagan virtues or there's a kind of implicit contrast between the ancient Indo-European uh, Mainerbund, the, the band of warrior brothers, and the kind of mindset of how do I get a bunch of trusted friends around me who are young and male and risk-seeking and out to get power and space and women? And there's the contrast between that point of view and the sort of domesticated uh, modern person who tries to embody the Christian virtues or as Mencius Moldbug has pointed out, the sort of neoliberal virtues that are a follow-on from Puritanism and Protestantism. Um, and there's a sort of seething, pervasive contempt for that level of domestication. And he basically wants to throw off the, uh, the yoke of servitude. Um, you talked about submit being... Um, a sort of rallying cry of, of BAPS followers. Tell me a little bit more about that. Oh, yeah, you were asking what, what is all this submit about. There were some people in the Twitter feed uh, asking, have we submitted? <laughs> and I was just explaining to Jeffrey before we started that submit is one of the slogans of the, of the BAP crowd. They say submit, exclamation point. And I think the idea there is that it's sort of that you should submit to BAP himself. Um, but I think the larger message is, kind of acknowledging hierarchy, right? So you should face the fact of who is above you, of who is more powerful than you, and you should submit to that. Yeah, so you, you remember uh, Jonathan Haidt's moral foundations, respect for hierarchy uh, versus sort of egalitarianism is is one of those dimensions. And obviously, BAP is on the sort of traditionalist pro-hierarchy, like there's a natural order of things, there's a scale of naturae, certain individuals are at the top, certain species are at the top, certain states of mind are better than others. And it's radically anti-postmodern in that sense. So very pro-hierarchy. It's very pro-male. He talks in pretty blunt terms about men and women. He generalizes recklessly. Yeah, women are like pets. Um, They're cute to have around. Yeah. Because they're relatively harmless. Um, but modern women who become very self-conscious and aggressive and ambitious, they lose all the charm of women. I mean, that's a Nietzschean insight itself, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, he talks about women being neurotic and, and like you shouldn't expect your wife to be your best friend and reestablish bonds with other men. And that comes, you know, straight out of the manosphere, 
the Red Pill guys, the Jonathan Glover, No More Mr. Nice Guy. Um, it also touches upon, um, oh, who was the guy who wrote um, about sort of male tribalism and bands of warriors and um, Jack Donovan. Okay. Jack Donovan reminded me a lot of many of his points and, and insights. In fact, I thought for a minute, okay, may, is this Jack Donovan's project? I, I doubt that. But so there's that. There's, there's a pervasive um, epistemology that's very skeptical. It says received wisdom, including all of your received knowledge of history, it might be a lot shakier than you realize. And some of this is, I think, just sort of counter-historian trolling. It's, there might have been three whole centuries in the Dark Ages that just were added in by later historians that didn't really exist. I'm pretty dubious about that. But there's a kind of fun openness to conspiracy theories that, that dive into potential revisionist visions of history and sort of a willingness to reinterpret history. And he points out, there are professional incentives for historians ever since Herodotus and the ancient Greeks to make shit up and to dramatize things and to write history in a very tribal way that denigrates and caricatures other tribes and cultures and builds up your own and that that has continued for thousands of years. So I think that fits with BAP's kind of anti-scholasticism and kind of reckless contempt for like, doing your research and making sure everything is properly referenced. Right. For sure. So that's kind of half content and half style. Um, I think one big theme is freedom and power. And like those Indo-European Maynard Buns, the, the war, the warrior bands, BAP is very focused on achieving control of resources and space and then the sort of reproductive benefits of that in a Darwinian sense being kind of add-ons and not actually very interesting or relevant it's like if you have space and controlled resources and you're a guy the, the women just sort of follow and like the sexual selection dynamics are not very interesting to him actually and that's a very different view of human evolution and history than I've promoted you know, I've focused on mutual mate choice as sort of the gold standard evolutionary process. This is a much more um, kind of social Darwinist view. It's, it's a much more of a kind of ecological view that mastery of your habitat and your food and your resources and tools is the central challenge. Hmm. And reproduction is kind of an afterthought. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I read it more as a kind of almost mystical vitalism and his, his beefs with evolutionary psychology, which I'm sure we, you know, you, you, you'll have much more to talk about. The way that I understood that is that there's this disconnect between evolutionary psychology as a theory that describes the maximum amount of variation in kind of the observable record of, of, you know, the history of species. He kind of says that's right. You know, he doesn't really reject that. But what he seems to be saying in my reading is that for a living person, especially a living man, to become too concerned with this evolutionary psychological theory is is a false path. That if, if you start if it starts to have an effect on how you are seeing things or how you are acting or making choices, that's the error of the bug man. Yeah. In other words. And so for the thinking, living, breathing, acting man, one should be one should have a kind of healthy disregard for something like evolutionary psychology. And what becomes much more relevant is a kind of deeply intuitive relationship with one's environment. And then that has that's where one finds the the life forces and the kind of intuitive, imminent uh, kind of callings or desires or drives that we have. And then he's more interested, I think, in saying to follow that, to focus on that. And that actually is in tension with a model of the world that is overly determined by, by evolutionary psychology. Because if, if you're, if you're kind of wrapped up in the theory of, of evolution, you will start to become the bug man who is only, you know, you become consciously 
aware that you're trying to, you know, signal for, for sexual mates and you're, you're trying to maximize your reproduction. And if that's how you think you're going to be a loser is essentially what he's saying. And I think there's, there's a deep truth to that, which I find, you know, valuable. Yeah. I think he would, he would say Darwin is for nerds. Like if you take evolutionary psychology too seriously, as I've spent my whole career doing, (laughs) then it's going to be a little bit enervating and neuroticizing and it will actually undercut the power of your instincts and your adaptations. And so I think BAP's approach to Darwinism seems to be trust your instincts, don't question them, don't necessarily dive too deeply into what exactly were their functions ancestrally. You don't really need to understand their details for them to just work. And I think that's sort of half true. In a way, the whole point of evolutionary psychology as a scientific discipline, as it originated, was to fight the blank slate, was to fight 20th century social constructivist views of human nature that said, it's all socialization, it's all learning, we don't have any instincts, genes don't matter, heredity doesn't matter, individual differences don't matter. Ev Psych has fought that for 30 years. Would we have even needed Ev Psych if we hadn't had that 20th century blank slate dogma? Mm. Maybe, maybe not. I think there's a lot of really useful insights and details that Ev Psych has developed. But to be honest, at the cultural level, the main function of Ev Psych has been to just swing the pendulum back from that blank slate social constructivism and to push back against um, the ungrounded and and idiotic and delusional claims of fields like gender feminism or the the denial of behavior genetics, things like that. Right. So if you never swallowed the blank slate ideology to begin with, you may not need Darwinism to find your path. I think that's one of his sort of subtexts here. Okay. Yeah. That, that, I, I buy that. I'm kind of interested in the references to God or gods. I mean, I think what one of the things that's kind of interesting about the, the BAP mentality to me is he seems to be trying to kind of put back on the agenda some type of relationship with some type of God. I think it's a bit more pagan, but um, like this, I think, for instance, is why like Tara Burton is very interested because she's a writer. She's very interested in religion and much more sympathetic to religion than kind of the average public intellectual, just like I am. And so I appreciate that. So like, for instance, when I hear them say submit, you know, I kind of laugh that off and I'm like, well, I certainly don't think anyone should submit to BAP as his followers, I think, kind of kind of do <laughs> in some way. Yeah. Um, but submission to God, I find a very attractive and appealing notion personally, because in a, in a weird way, if, if you acknowledge God as sort of, even if you only... For your own mind, you think of it as just a theoretical entity, as just a kind of abstract placeholder for the most powerful thing in, in the universe or something like that. That is something I think worth submitting to, and, and you want, one could defend a kind of submission to that. Because what's cool about that is you're kind of acknowledging the reality of hierarchy without being anyone's bitch. You know, you're still like, you see yourself as absolutely equal to any other person, and you, and you see yourself as a truly, you know, independent, you know, non-negotiable force in the world. But if you submit to God, you are still grounding yourself in a kind of hierarchy. So I'm not saying this is necessarily a reading of BAP, but to the degree that to the degree that he kind of is painting a, a picture for us of a world in which gods do play some sort of role and submission does play some sort of role. That's 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 how I am interested in it. I think there's also an implicit contrast against both Islam and and the sort of centralized imperial hierarchies that you see in maybe China. Mm. So Islam literally means submission. Mm. And I think submit is kind of a clever twist on that, almost to say Western civilization needs to rediscover the, the power that comes from submitting to some god, even if it's fictional, even if you kind of know it's fictional, you don't really believe in it. I think if you have a very hierarchical mindset... And you think, of course, I have to submit to something because hierarchy goes all the way up and all the way down. But you know what? The only person I'm really submitting to is a deity, which means I'm the next best thing in terms of status, power, prestige. Yeah. So there's a weird 
mind hack, I think, that's going Absolutely. on there. Yes. And I don't think that, um, I think it's very, very hard for a kind of standard neoliberal within their Overton window to understand how do you get power from submitting to the gods? But I think this is, this is the hack, that if you're God's lieutenant, but God actually doesn't intervene that much, you're de facto in charge. Yeah, that's a really, really good way of putting it. That's essentially, I, I completely agree. And you know who else is doing exactly this right now in, in a pretty amazing way? Do, do you know? Tell me. Kanye West. Have you been following him at all? I've, I've heard a little bit about what's happening, but, but this is um, very topical and, yeah. and timely. So tell me a little more about sure, that. Sure, yeah. People might think this is a crazy tangent, but it's not. I promise you I'll, 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 I'll come full, full circle and uh, ca- cash this out. So Kanye West, many people know, uh, you know, he he's he's he says what he thinks. And, you know, he's been known for saying some provocative things over the years that have, that's got him in a lot of trouble and uh, in many different crowds and audiences. And uh, so he's, he's known as a kind of loose cannon. And, and he, recently he's known for his mental health problems because his, his kind of extremely creative and loose cannon nature, you know, when you pursue that to a certain limit, it, it can it, I think it can have real uh, problems, and uh, he recently had a mental a mental breakdown not too long ago. Mm-hmm. So, um, in the aftermath of that, in his recovery and his bouncing back from that, he released a new album which is called Jesus Is King, and it's he's always been kind of Christian. He's always kind of talked about it a little bit. You can find stuff dating back to like ten years ago where he's saying like pretty Christian stuff. He has some songs that are are pretty explicit, um, but there's also a lot of you know, I love hoes this kind of mm-hmm. stuff also, right? Yeah. Um, so it's it's a kind of very, very light, uh, guarded Christianity mixed in with a lot of cool, sexy, secular sinfulness, you know? Um, this is the first time that now he's, it's it's a straight up Christian album in, in some sense. And he seems to be pretty, on, pretty sincere and explicit about, he's like a real Christian now. And it's really interesting because he's at the top of the game. He's an cr- obvious creative genius, whether you like him or not. I mean, he's, absolutely prolific, um, incredibly creative and successful, and not just as a, as a music artist, but as a fashion designer and as a businessman. He's obviously worth huge sums of money. Um, he has a mental breakdown and then bounces back in this kind of explicit public submission to God, essentially. And he's now very explicit about it. You can find interviews. I listened to this awesome, like, one-hour interview with him last night on YouTube. It's amazing. He's, like, totally un- unhinged still yeah. and really based. Uh, and it's amazing. And I think you only can get that through submission to God, because I think the problem is if you are truly creative and you are truly powerful and you really honestly don't give a shit what people think about mm-hmm. you and you're going to fucking do what you're going to do, whether people like it or not, if you don't submit to something, yes, you're going to go crazy. Yeah. And, and, and essentially I think he realized that mm-hmm. and he's owning it. And a lot of Christian people, a lot of Catholic people are like really interested in this. And I think, I think it's really cool and impressive and it's, it's very relevant to, to what we're talking about. I think. This sounds tangential, but I think it kind of gets to the heart of the book in a way that I hadn't even thought about before we started this. So yay for dialogue. (laughs) Um, In Kanye's case, he, he came out as having bipolar, right? Okay. I I think, think I think that's right. Not an expert. Um, I've studied mood disorders and it, it certainly seems plausible. Like, yeah, he's got some manic episodes and maybe some depression, but also of course he's got world-class narcissism, particularly when he was younger. Like he was a genius and he really fucking knew it and wanted to tell the world about it and show it off. The problem, if you're an atheist genius is you don't really have a structure for reining in that runaway narcissism. Yep. I faced this a little bit in grad school. I was very, very arrogant intellectually. You know, I'm kind of smart, but I was, to be honest, smarter back then, younger. Fluid intelligence peaks in the early 20s. And I knew I had good ideas. I think in retrospect, one way that I kind of managed them was instead of submitting to God, I submitted to science and scholarship, and particularly Darwin. Darwin became my sort of icon of... I think I'm hot shit, but I knew my respect for him was even stronger. Mm. And half of the ideas I had, he had already had. So by kind of submitting to Darwin as a sort of 
patriarchal godlike figure, it actually kind of helped preserve my mental health because it kept me from having these kind of runaway delusions of grandeur. I could never convince myself, oh, everything I'm you know, writing in the mating mind is 100% original. By contrast, Bapp says, well, Nietzsche would try to avoid reading other people because he didn't want to be infected by their ideas. Okay, that kind of makes sense from a kind of like purity-oriented, I don't want to be infected with bad memes point of view. Like that's kind of the rationale for Congress telling Facebook you have to get rid of fake news. We don't want to be infected by meme cooties. The problem with Nietzsche doing that is there's nothing to rein in his runaway narcissism. And he does get delusions of grandeur. And they're exacerbated by having, you know, syphilis and it fucking up his brain in later years. But I suspect Kanye, at least at an unconscious level, realized there's this amazing God hack where if I submit to a Christian God, any God, it actually helps me be more productive, more on an even keel, and even a more effective genius. Because I don't think I'm the biggest thing around. That's right. It also gives you something to wrap your pursuit of glory around. Like pr- the glory, glory is a kind of traditional masculine uh, aspiration, and there is a decline of a sense of glory today. Most you know, young men. They, they, they have drives towards something like glory because there is something natural there. But most secular kind of normal bug men are incapable of really aspiring towards a, a true kind of historical glory. And I think that's in part because of the decline of God and, and, the, and the incapacity to believe. Because the only way that you can do things on this earth that are truly profound and revolutionary that no one else wants to do, that everyone else is afraid to do. The only way to do that is you have to kind of hang yourself on some type of pivot, some type of fulcrum Mm -hmm. that is to some degree outside of this world. I think at least that's, that's kind of how I see it. And, you know, so there's like this, this passage in the opening part of, of, of the bat book where he talks about Empedocles Mm -hmm. and Mount Etna and, uh, you know, Empedocles is famous for throwing himself into, into the volcano, essentially. And, you know, in, in a kind of pursuit of glory or what have you. And that sort of thing is, is sort of unthinkable for most Western men today. And, yeah, I'm all for bringing back a submission to God as the pathway to a reclamation of the pursuit of glory and kind of profound creative independence yeah, it's not it's not a kind of oppressive, you know, authoritarian constraint like so many stupid people think it is. It's 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 a hack, as you put it, that unlocks uh, a profound kind of liberation combined with a kind of based anchoring. Yeah. So, it, one mark of a good book is when you're trying to talk about it, it actually sparks new ideas, and you go off on tangents that aren't actually even that related to the book. But here we are. Um, I think for the Maynardbund, the Band of Brothers, their pursuit of glory was all about me as an individual, going to be a great warrior. My name will echo down through history. Um, my highest aspiration is to have a glorious death that my my brothers will will sing about forever. That's very much a sort of Indo-European um, warrior mindset. It's a Viking mindset. It's a Bronze Age, a, a Bronze Age mindset, perhaps. Would, yeah. perhaps. And th- this submitting submitting to God is a little bit different. I think, you know, whereas a modern billionaire will typically build a skyscraper named after themselves, like a Trump Tower, literally, or they'll endow a university research center that's named after them. Um your medieval rich guys would fund the building of a cathedral for the glory of God, and then they would bask in that reflected glory. So, yeah, their name or their likeness would be included in the cathedral, but the, it would be Lincoln Cathedral for the town of Lincoln, not some particular guy's cathedral. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also an interesting status hack, that you can actually get all the prestige of supporting a collective endeavor 
without looking like too much of a, of a narcissist or an egoist. Yeah, that's right. That's true. It's a way to be kind of aggressively narcissistic about your own ambitions and powers without actually falling into the traps of narcissism because you're, you're chalking it up to something higher, something above you. And I think even, even publishing a book anonymously in a way is also a sort of hack for distancing the persona of the person ostensibly writing the book Bronze Age Pervert versus whoever that person really is. And so if you make that distinction between like this is my real life versus my social media or authorial persona, you don't have to take that authorial persona too seriously. And you also kind of have to, to think about the care and feeding of it. Like, how am I going to support my ongoing social media persona? And, and I feel this, like, if I haven't tweeted in a while, it's like, people are missing Primal Poly out there, I think, maybe. <laughs> like, I have to maintain this. I have to water that plant. You know, I have to um, feed that, that horse or whatever. So I think we've talked about submission. We've talked about power. Um, the other dimension, of course, of, of submit is it's got a little bit of a, a BDSM power exchangey edge to it. And when I lecture about BDSM in my human sexuality class, I emphasize it freaks people out because we've absorbed this sort of egalitarian vision of highly consensual sex that is sort of supposed to be the gold standard for sexual ethics but that actually a lot of people find really asexy, like not very sexy, not very hot. And I think what the Manosphere is doing, what the Red Pill guys are doing, what, what BAP is doing is trying to put the, the power back into sex. Mm. The gender feminists will say rape is a crime of power, not sex, but they actually don't have a very coherent way of thinking about the relations between um, power and sex. So I think domination, submission. Um, it, it's just kind of fascinating to me that you can see elements of that hierarchical psychology, both in the relationship between worshipers and their God, um, the warrior bands and their sort of leaders, and people doing BDSM role play in, in their own bedrooms. There's a thirst for that right. kind of hierarchical power structure. Right. And modern civilization is very, very uncomfortable with that. Yeah, that's a good diagnosis. I think you're right. It's it's tapping something there. It's tapping some sort of unsatisfied latent demand for something like that. Now, I have a question for you. Have you seen the the images online that are associated with BAP and his crowd, the uh, hot male Chad photos that he likes to post and that his, his followers <laughs> like to post? Yeah. Like, wh what do you think's up with that? What's your diagnosis of that? <laughs> I think this is another case where people are absolutely unable to understand what the fuck's going on yeah. with the worship of the male physique without shoehorning it into there's latent homosexuality going on here. I don't think that actually makes sense. I think it's a total failure to understand how um, boys and young men actually tune into what is going to be successful as I grow up in terms of training strategies and regimens and paths to material and reproductive success. So when these people in the BAP crowd like to pass around photos of, uh, for folks who haven't seen what I'm talking about, it's usually, it's not just <laughs> like jacked men with their shirts off. It's like extreme, <laughs> extremely jacked men, yep. like hilariously jacked men uh, with their shirts off or half naked or even often making somewhat like sexual poses so this is something that they'd like to pass around, but your diagnosis, if I hear you correctly, Jeffrey, is that this is actually a pretty straightforward, non-sexual uh, valorization and admiration of, of male strength. That's how you read it? I think it's a little bit complicated, but imagine, um, imagine two different 10-year-old boys with different psychologies and ask yourself who would do better in a sort of prehistoric competition for resources, status, and mates. One 10-year-old boy pays very close attention to which young men are big and strong and capable and respected and have killed other men and mated with women and care about hierarchy and status. And I'm going to sort of pay a lot of attention to those role models, those aspirational figures. 
like really close attention. What do they do? How do they act? How do they look? Because I want to transform myself to be more like them. Does that mean you actually want to have sex with them? I don't think it does. It means there's a psychological adaptation that directs your attention to the good phenotypic traits of you know, body, brain, and behavior that are worth emulating. Imagine the other 10-year-old who like, looks around and sees a bunch of people, some of them successful, some not, and who's like, I don't know who I should imitate or who I should learn from. I'm not even going to pay attention to who has more muscles or who's more capable in hunting and fighting. I don't think that 10-year-old boy is going to do as well. So I imagine there's a pretty long history of selection for boys and men to pay attention to like who's worth emulating mm. and for their physical and behavioral features to capture our attention. It's just like when men watch war movies. Why do we find it fascinating to watch fighting and bloodshed? We've seen hundreds of decapitations by age 30 if you, if you watch TV and movies. So why watch yet another one? Because we've evolved to pay very close attention to combat. So that's a that's a cool reading of it for sure. And I think you're definitely, there's something there. The thing that doesn't quite square up with that is these these men who, who are kind of uh, idolized in, in the BAP sphere, they're, they're kind of so jacked that I do believe that for extreme bodybuilders, there, there's fitness cost, right? Like that that's not an optimal body, right? Uh, for extreme, extremely jacked men. So there's something else. You're, I think you're right, but there's something else going on, right? Because if, if it was just what you said, then they would pass around photos of kind of ideally, optimally fit, strong men, yep. um, but kind of more in the traditional mold of like, you know, Calvin Klein, yep. you know, underwear models or whatever, like pretty, you know, fit, chiseled, mm -hmm. healthy, you know, good looking men with, you know, all the women and the, the nice cars and all of that, right? So there's something, there's something, there's an extra component going on. I don't know. Is it, is it satirical? Is it somewhat homosexual? Is it just edgelording? Is it just kind of the the thrill of extreme, uh, you know, depictions? But um, there's something there's something interesting and weird going on with the the particular fetishization of these like extremely jacked men in often sexual kind of uh, angles. I think the analogy I would make here is why do teenage girls love watching YouTube makeup tutorials? Is it that they're all latent lesbians and they just love seeing beauty because they want the beauty, they want to interact with the beauty as a lover? Or is it just, wow, she knows how to do magic with eyeshadow that'll increase my attractiveness. I'm going to pay very close attention to that. I think it's the same with men, young men paying a lot of attention to bodybuilders, athletes, but also like within the domain of science, the sort of worship of any particular figures you consider to be a genius you you hone in on those traits you want to cultivate and that doesn't necessarily mean right. like i wanted to fuck darwin just because i worship darwin right right or like i have a thing about the rock i think the rock is awesome i think dwayne johnson's amazing but i really don't have any kind of homoerotic thing it's just he's an aspirational figure worth tracking he's a vector that you can aim towards right even if it's in an extreme form that's actually almost inhuman and 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 actually quite suboptimal yeah it still represents just a kind of dramatization of what you should be aspiring for is that kind of what you yeah because in a way you you don't want your you know in machine learning there's the idea of like the training set the set that you train the ai system on so it learns better and models the world correctly you actually want a training set that doesn't necessarily reflect the world perfectly, but that challenges your learning system. In the case of any particular trait, you want such an extreme version of the trait that you have a very, very clear idea what to aim for, even if you could never overshoot to that degree, mm. right? Right. Yeah, and, I mm. and I think the interesting thing is that you also have these sort of... Um, myths and stories that caution young men against over fetishizing any particular trait. For example, back to the Troy movie, the opening scene, Achilles versus Bo Boagrius, this huge hulking tall warrior that the Mycenaeans are fighting. 
Achilles dispatches him with a single stab to the subclavian artery from his sword because Achilles can jump higher and he's more agile. And I think that's a kind of lesson to the young man. Don't be like Boagrius. Don't go quite that extreme in terms of musculature. Um, walk it back a little bit. Be more like Achilles, a little more well-rounded. Right. Yeah, you could also make the argument that people are already kind of numb to just normal depictions of strong, fit men. So to really kind of convey what Bap is trying to say, you need these kind of extreme, ridiculous images of, <clears throat> of male strength. Could be something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, what you also made me think about is there's a there's another example of this sort of phenomenon in also having to do with women on the, on the Internet, which is like if you look at all of like the Instagram thoughts, um, you know, you find people with like these – huge asses right and like your huge boobs super super tiny waists and maybe some of it's photoshop maybe some of it's like botox and liposuction here and there but it's it's to such you often see these with these women that the proportions are to such an extreme degree that it i think it really overshoots the mark you know like there is this well-known and documented idea that there's this kind of hourglass figure that that men are optimally attracted to but you can be like so hourglass that it, you act, it, you get this kind of uncanny valley where it's just kind of like freakish um and and there's like i think a fair number of women who are who are actively jumping into that uncanny valley right and so it's kind of a similar thing i think with with the bap with the bap kind of valorization of extreme male strength and i think in a way the whole style of bronze age mindset is kind of analogous to one of these super muscular muscular Schwarzenegger or or the rock style physiques. It's like if you want to write a provocative piece of work in a very reckless way that's maximally interesting and entertaining, here's an example of how to do that. Like maybe in your own writing, you don't need to go this far, but it's like um, World War One you know, soldiers charging up out of the, um, the trenches and one guy has the flag and he tries to at least get the flag as far in front of the trench as possible as a sort of aspirational mark. I think this book itself is, is trying to be that kind of um, aspirational flag to say, look, you guys don't have to write in exactly this style, but you can adopt a little bit of the looseness and, and recklessness and like kind of contempt for logic and scholarship. And that might be a good thing. I think BAP lovers are going to chime in at this point and say that we're being bug men about this. Like we're over analyzing it. We're having yeah. this kind of spirit of seriousness. We're like thinking about it like social scientists and that we are losing our male vitality. Like I want, do you think that's true or do you think, or another possibility is that we are actually you and I in our own trajectories and in, in our own projects and lives we may be actually be, we might be much more like BAP than people, like we might all be kind of trafficking in a similar spirit or direction at this, at this moment. Because in some sense we're doing, like we're already doing something that is kind of like a, a, a BAP equivalent in the academic system is right. In some sense. So, um, and if w for us as social scientists and, you know, uh, for the types of people that we are, perhaps us finding our, you know, uh, submission to the gods and the, uh, you know, connecting with our more intuitive, imminent life forces. Maybe for us, it just looks, the, it, it, it looks a little different, right? It's inevitably going to, it's going to have these weird kind of social scientific tones and whatever. And maybe that's a, maybe that's actually an important kind of idea here or, or implication possibly, which is that like BAP is doing BAP for the tiny subculture of weird people that BAP represents. But to do to 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 express that kind of larger vitalism, which I'm completely on board with, and which ult ult that's ultimately what I like most about BAP, and why I'm t why I'm willing to go on YouTube talking about this like random self published uh, book, is because it does convey a kind of vitalism that I think is essential, and which I do really believe in, and I think it's just maybe worth noting that for different people that should look very very different, and some people will say that we're being bug men, but other people will say that we're being like that we're being reckless or we're like wasting our time on, you know, like kind of independent self-publishing stuff about, you know, meaningless, low status stuff on the internet, you know, like that's, that's another yeah. kind of critique we're inclined to get. Whereas really like we're, you know, there is a larger underlying spirit in all of these kind of free wheeling, independent internet dynamics going on right now, which is essentially like cutting loose from 
the expectations of the herd and just going deeper with whatever kind of life forces to use a kind of corny word, but that's like essentially out of BAP that, mm-hmm. that, that are, that are true to you or something like that. It's very hard to say this without like the kind of corny language, but something like that, I think. Yeah. I think even within, let's say semi-intellectual contexts like conferences, there's a huge spectrum of how much vitalism do you feel when you walk into a conference? The far extreme actually for me would be the paleo FX conferences in Austin that I attended for a few years, where it's all about paleo health and fitness. And they had literal like stacks of kettlebells in the middle of the conference. And everybody was like going to seminars, but also working out. Everybody was in great shape, like, you know, oozing vitality. The Uh, other sex was there. And, there was there was sex. There was a lot of bacon being eaten. There was free range meat, and to me, I was like, "Wow, this is really, really different from, let's say, the other extreme, mm-hmm. a standard social psychology conference, mm-hmm. typical social psych conference. Hundreds of people, full of fear, full mm-hmm. of fear, afraid to offend each other, mm-hmm. hoping that my little research on bias and prejudice and sexism or racism or whatever I'm studying, whatever part of human nature I disapprove of, I hope my research will be validated and approved by my, by my peers. So there's like the exact opposite of that kind of warrior band spirit of like, there's territory, take it. In typical social psych conference, it's, oh shit, the territory's already taken. This habitat is crowded. I can only succeed if I ingratiate myself with my peers and mentors and everybody else. And the, the overall sense is a very low level of vitality. Yeah. In fact, vitality would actually be pretty stigmatized right. in that context. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I want to make a point here that uh, people will probably accuse me of uh, shoehorning this this topic into kind of my own pet interests, but, and there is this problem that, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. People might be aware. I did just write a book about Deleuze, uh, but there are very strong overlaps with a kind of Deleuzean worldview here because what Deleuze teaches us is that, well, first of all, he's also very interested in space. He's interested in, you know, he conducts some studies on the nomads of the steppe, Hmm. like Genghis Khan, and he's very interested in imminence, which I think is, is very relevant here also. And, because what, what I was saying before is that I think BAP is really trying to kind of reconnect us with our own kind of um, imminent nature, if you will. And what what I think is going on between Deleuze and, and BAP in some, in some regard, the, the middle of the Venn diagram there, is that your, your, uh, your being in space, like your feeling of the space around you, is a really, really important signal. Like you should trust those signals. In other words, you should, fo- you should, you should try, like if you walk into a conference and you just kind of feel heavy, anxious, stressed, and you don't feel like you're, you know, if you're not being called to, you know, express your capacities, if that's not what's being, if that's not what's happening in, in, in your mind and body, you should take that seriously. You know, you should, there's a problem there, right? And you should, Think about running away as fast as you can, possibly yeah. not necessarily, but possibly, right? I think that's a sen- that's certainly what BAP is trying to say in, in some regard. You're going to uh, escape whatever is like that and build your own space. Essentially, create create environments where your your force is is able to run free. And um, you know, I think Deleuze was actually also saying that in, in his own kind of uh, philosophical register. But uh, yeah, that's just an interesting. That's just an interesting kind of connection. I probably don't need to go too much into that, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, it's a sort of fun contrast to the concept of the safe space, right? The safe space is domesticated space. Everybody is welcome. Everybody has a sort of equal claim on the resources and the social norms of the space. I think BAP is more interested in wild spaces, unconquered spaces or at least colonizable spaces. This is why I chose my my space background, you know, to kind of remind people that in a way for me, the whole point of all of this exercise is colonize the galaxy. That's the end game. Um, everything else is kind of bullshit. So um, I think that 
is also very much Bronze Age mindset. I think in a way, Elon Musk is more Bronze Age mindset even than a lot of guys who are very, very proud of their their deadlifts on mm. on Twitter. Mm. Um, so it, an interesting. That's a provocative point. I wonder what the bat people will say about that. I definitely see your point. I think a lot of people would say, just like they would say to me, Thug Man. Yeah. Well, yeah, but who's going to be remembered in a thousand years? Mm. Um, Elon Musk is going to be the Achilles of the 30th century. There's going to be a mythology around him. There are going to be stories told about his weird relationship with Grimes and people like misspell his name and her name. And th that's obviously the way things are going to go if, you know, we succeed in colonizing Mars, for example. Okay, so I feel like so far we've been very generous to BAP. We're both very interested in his project and we respect what the, what the BAP individual or BAP team, in my theory, uh, has done. And, and so I think that's all great. But I think maybe now would be a good time then to to dig in a little bit more critically, perhaps. Uh, I don't want this to be too much of a circle jerk, if you will. Uh, uh, if I, is that too inappropriate for you? I don't no, know. no, okay, that's fine. <laughs> I have to circle remember. jerks are a thing that young men sometimes do. Jeffrey and I have this kind of funny dynamic because I'm like completely set sailed from the academic institutions. Of course, Jeffrey has not. And uh, so I have to kind of sometimes like, uh, pinch myself and <laughs> not get not get too carried away. Um, so what I was going to say is just that there is something about the Bat Project which I think I'm not super into, which is the kind of ulterior the ulterior plot. And you know it's not that big a deal. I'm not going to come down hard on him or judge him or more. I'm certainly not going to moralize or anything like that. But I'm a little hesitant. I don't want to celebrate too much the the kind of image which I which I think the the Bat project kind of puts out there, which I do think is a misleading image and which is uh, a somewhat, yeah, if my theory is right anyway, a, a somewhat kind of reprehensible and perhaps uh, disingenuous type of image, which is that this is just a random guy who's anonymously self-publishing a book and whoa, it's made this huge splash. That That's definitely the the, the image that's put out there. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just, I just don't buy that. And that doesn't mean it's a bad project. I think it's kind of, I honestly, I think psyops are kind of interesting. Um, I have, you know, I've conducted a few of my own. And uh, so nothing against psyops. But when I do it, I try to be honest about it, you know, especially afterwards. Like, you know, I, I, I try to put everything in its proper place. My, my thing with the BAP project is I do think that there's like, there's essentially, there is a kind of like uh, hidden cabal that is making this book successful and making it impactful. And uh, as I said, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, you know, we should... We should be aware of that, I think, and not kind of treat BAP as some sort of like lone genius uh, who's who's just kind of risen on on his own merits. Of course, like no one really rises on their own merits. Everything's networked. Obviously, everything has to do with social capital. So, you know, I'm certainly not claiming any purity in that regard. But uh, yeah, I think I think it's worth talking about, right? Because I I think you know there's there's to some degree he is kind of like mobilizing this kind of mass of followers. Mm -hmm who are kind of, I think, infatuated with a a vision of him or an um, image of him that I don't think is real, personally. But then again, I'm not yeah. certain. It's all very mysterious. Well, the tricky thing is once you sort of abandon the neoliberal enlightenment scientific tradition that says everything you say should be completely earnest, expressed as clearly as possible, transparent to all possible audiences, and should be able to be assimilated into a grand global unified narrative of how the world works and how we should progress. Once you abandon that, and once communication becomes strategic and signaling and in-groupish and ironic or symbolic or um, there's dog whistles and all kinds of shit going on, once you get into that domain of thinking strategically, um, it's sort of like, do you owe any transparency mm. to the out group? The mm. Viking warriors weren't just a bunch of disorganized berserkers. They were strategic and tricky, you know, deceptive bastards. They would have loved Sun Tzu's art of war about how you take advantage of every possible lack of information the enemy has. You use surprise. You don't play by their rules. You win. The point is winning. And, you know, there's been ongoing debates in both the left and the right about 
to what extent should you respect universalizable principles of truth and justice versus do whatever it takes to win. And I think this is more in the sort of tradition of do what it takes, communicate to the people you respect and who you want to recruit to your cause. And I think the interesting thing is the number of like gratuitously offensive things he says in in BAM. Like he has little pot shots, offhanded comments about liberals and Darwinians and evolutionary psychologists and women and Jewish people and Basques, Arabs, nerds, incels, service workers, the Chinese, African men, every possible group you could offend. Like you cannot read this book with a thin skin. So why is he doing that? I think it's basically saying, bro, if you can't expand your Overton window, you're not welcome here. Like, this is an unsafe, wild space. Right. Get the fuck out if you can't handle, like, offhanded snarkiness about the security guards and malls or whatever. Right. So it's kind of shit-testing the reader. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But what about when you're misleading your own in-group? You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of my, that's one of my beefs with the whole, like, anonymous Twitter thing. Like, I understand it. Like, people have jobs and everything's so politically correct right now that people are right to kind of worry about getting in trouble, getting doxxed or whatever. So, I have no beef with anonymity in general. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, the, the problem comes in when anonymous accounts, which might be produced by collectives and who knows what, are essentially training the youth to think certain things or do certain things. And there's actually no one accountable behind that. You know, again, I'm not moralizing. Like, I'm not telling BAP to stop or, or like, saying, oh, we should crack down on this. No, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm totally, totally support the widest range of, uh, you know, cultural provocations. But I think we can also judge as individuals, like, what is um, a good and bad me- mode of radical public intellectualism on its merits. And so, like, I, Curtis Yarvin, for instance, who, uh, you know, everyone knows I'm, I'm, I, I, I quite admire uh, Curtis's writing, and uh, but he, I think he's a little bit guilty of something in all of this, in, in in my in my judgment, and this is just a friendly kind of respectful quibble, which is that you know what made the Moldbug blog so interesting and powerful, I think, was in part his kind of absolute resignation from practical politics. Mm-hmm. It was a kind of you know he he said many times like, I have absolutely no illusions about the utter kind of fringe marginal nature of these ideas which are extremely out of fashion and he even says explicitly a few times to to you know in, in one way or another he says you know one should uh, be okay with that and focus on you know figuring out the truth and becoming worthy you know spend your time becoming worthy don't uh, worry about like you know uh, maneuvering for power or something like that and then I see him kind of doing these like obviously coordinated kind of media campaigns with someone like BAP and for people who don't know what I'm referring to, it's just that recently the BAP is back on the agenda. Everyone's talking about BAP right now, including us. We fell for it, hook, line, and sinker, so touche. Um, Submit, and, Justin. And, oh, Submit. Yeah. Submit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I yeah. Um, but the reason is because BAP recently wrote something in uh, this, I think, newish online magazine by the not-so-newish Claremont Institute. The magazine is called American Mind on the internet. Um, but it wasn't just BAP. It was... Uh, someone wrote a review of BAP and Curtis Yarvin responded and BAP wrote his own thing. And this was all like in the span of a a week or two. And uh, so that's why this is kind of back on the agenda. And so going back to Curtis Yarvin, for instance, who, who as as I said, uh, you know, I appreciate it very much. I don't think he really has stuck to his guns on this kind of like radically resigned, detached kind of radical intellectual model. I do think that he's still kind of his eyes are still on the centers of power. And I think this is like one of the most common and pervasive failure modes for all types of radical intellectuals, which is like you, it's very hard to, to really and truly detach from the vulgar, ugly, essentially dishonest and disingenuous games that are required in any kind of pursuit of power. And so when I see, you know, uh, Curtis kind of engaging in these uh, semi-coordinated kind of media psyops, and when I see someone like BAP, who clearly 
has some friends in good places and knows how to time things in, in a very kind of strategic way. And yet it's from behind uh, the cover of a kind of anonymous um, identity. I do, I do think that there's a trap there, you know, and again, I'm not moralizing, but I do think that there is a trap there for the, for the path of the radical intellectual. And uh, clearly it's succeeding in terms of instrumental benefits and political power or whatever. But uh, to me in the long run, if that's the, if that's the path you go down, you're inevitably going to become what you hate. You're going to reproduce precisely the kind of uh, corrupt, stodgy, uh, overly kind of instrumentalized and an oppressive herd that is essentially all fighting for uh, the same scraps of, of shared centralized attention. Yeah. Well, so one level, Bronze Age mindset is an, an incredibly kind of reckless and, and loose, but at another level, it's an incredibly disciplined in that it never as far as I remember, talks about Trump or the Democrats or wokeness or like any of the, or, you know, um, trade disputes or any of any of the current political shit that constitutes 80% of Twitter. It is almost puritanical about not getting caught up in the concerns of the day and the news cycle. And I do have a lot of respect for that because anybody like, like us who's involved in social media knows damned well the way to get massive retweets is do a timely tweet about some current issue that makes an easy virtue signal. And it takes incredible discipline not to do that and to keep your eye on the long-term mindset and the goal and and the theology (laughs) and the mind. Yeah. And, um, I can see it's it's tempting for anybody, whether you're you know, neoliberal, neo-reactionary, whatever, to try to get approval from the existing centers of power and and prestige. Right. And to the extent that BAP can avoid falling into that trap, like we don't need BAP's take on universal basic income <laughs> or global warming or whatever. There needs to be a space for people to kind of operate at his level of abstraction and kind of timelessness. Right. I, I agree that it's the abstract and timelessness that I like. It's the I think it's a, a bit of a trap to get involved in the kind of the debates and the, the, the conflicts of like the right wing mm-hmm. politics in America, for instance. I mean, like, the, you know, the, the essays that came out in American Mind were, were quite interesting. I'm happy to see you know, Curtis Yarvin uh, writing again. And, and so it's all very fine, very fine and interesting stuff. Uh, but I do think that it's essentially, f- you know, falling back into the trap of becoming overly invested in something that uh, true intellectuals like shouldn't really be too bothered by. I, I guess a more constructive way to say what I'm saying is like, I would love to see a BAP who, of, who, who's like a real person, who's like living the lifestyle that he articulates I would be so much more interested in that. Like a true BAP, in other mm-hmm. words, like what I'm getting at is an authentic BAP would be so living the lifestyle of BAP mm-hmm. that you would have no time for like what nerdy like Republican strategists think. Yeah. He's not interested in having debates with the Claremont Institute. A true yeah. BAP would not be interested in debating with the Claremont Institute. That's essentially the, that's the crux of my my little bit of critique here. Like I, I would like to see BAP, you know, swinging from ropes in a jungle or something like that, doing whatever, I don't know, maps do uh, or are supposed to do. And uh, if that was like a real person living like that, I would be, I would be much more on board with that or like, does that make sense? Yeah. So to to kind of bring it back down to the the submit motto, um, what you don't want to do, of course, is submit to the demands of the New York Times or the Claremont Institute or the demands of academic scientific establishment more than necessary to get tenure. Like once you do that, right. great. The problem is some of the would be BAPs who are out, who have their face out there, haven't done the Kanye West move of submitting to anything greater than themselves. Mm. So you do get figures like Nassim Taleb, for example, where there is a kind of runaway narcissism and grandiosity that is not tempered by submission to anything no God, no institute. Once you have fuck you money, but you don't have faith, Mm. you can get this runaway narcissism train. And if you have enough followers submitting to you, you think you're the God emperor of Dune. And 
uh, that I think is a path towards um, true degeneracy because you're not accountable to anybody other than yourself and people are lazy so they don't hold themselves to account right. epistemically right. or morally. And it's inevitable to not essentially fall back into investment in kind of status quo yeah. political debates. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's, the, that's the point there to me. So what's the takeaway? You're going to have to submit to something if you don't want your, your manic genius to go off the rails. And the question is, what are you going to submit to? Um, is it going to be the existing elite intelligentsia culture or is it going to be mainstream media or is it just chasing clicks? Right. Submitting to the demands of monetization. Is it going to be submitting to one or more gods, whoever they might be? Is it going to be submitting to the demands of science or the demands of utilitarian moral philosophy like the effective altruists do? You got to choose your um, your god to worship. That's right. And if you're not going to worship God, then you're going to submit to me, Bap, <laughs> Curtis. You too, Curtis. I want you only to be writing on your blog. Restart your blog. Don't worry about the Claremont Institute. It's a distraction. And Bap, it's time to come clean. Be yourself. I want to see your beautiful, jacked, masculine body in the flesh. I want to see how you live. And Bap, if you turn out to be a, a genius, scrawny 15-year-old boy who's just got it all figured out, more power to you. We'll, we'll still uh, love to meet you. I think that's a, that's a good note to end on. Um, did you want to go been, over any of these questions or not? Nah? It's been a really fun conversation. Okay, let's take a few minutes. I guess we did hit the some end. of them this anyway. Is, this, is sort of, this is sort of the appendix, the extras. Um, these are from Twitter. We covered a fair amount about the domestication of man and space, about spatial dynamics. One question, we talked a little bit about mold bug. Yeah, I guess talked the, about bug man. Bug man, yeah. I mean, I don't know what more to say about that. Bug man is, is BAP's term for, how, how would you describe? Oh, this? just like your typical Western yeah, office worker, essentially. You know, bug man, that it, it actually refers to like the bad posture that a lot of us have, you know, because like the average, the kind of average male office worker has a bit of a pot belly, is a bit slouched from like sitting at the computer. And if you look at them in profile, they kind of, they look like a weird bug. Okay. That's, that's where bug men, that's where that idea comes from. So bug, bug men, AKA beta males, AKA worker drones, similar, AKA similar. people who have failed to read fight club. NPCs, you know. non-player characters. Right. Yeah. These are all, um, all of that. Yes. Um, I guess the one big question that I did get out, so I put out a Twitter call for what, what do you want us to talk about in, in relation to BAP? And um, we got some really good suggestions, many of which we've integrated into this uh, discussion. One was, okay, is, is this sort of BAP thing going to grow in prominence or is it going to remain fringe? So what are the prospects for this kind of communication or style or this kind of anonymous edge lord? persona or this kind of um, content. Mm -hmm. I think the prospects are good. I think this is one, one point I wanted to make. It's a, it's a mistake to imagine that every good book you encounter can be easily summarized in an elevator pitch. Nietzsche is really hard to summarize. It's, it's a mindset, it's a tonic, it's a way of challenging your intellectual immune system. It's a, um, it's a method of kind of like intellectual hormesis where you, it's like taking a cold shower. It just washes away all, all the shit. And I think we need a lot more books like that. I think this serves that purpose. Nietzsche served that purpose. I think the new book by Delicious Tacos kind of does something similar. Chuck Palahniuk's novels did this. Um, every provocateur knows I'm not making an evidence-based logical case for a complete coherent rational worldview. That is not the goal. I'm trying to hit the reset button on your models of reality. Mm. That's a good way to put it. And I definitely think it. this all bodes well for... <coughs> 
the near future of kind of radical, creative, independent intellectual work on the internet. You know, in some sense, the, probably the greatest compliment I could give to Bronze Age Pervert is that the release of Bronze Age, Bronze Age Mindset, or is it Bronze Age, Bronze Age Mentality? I mindset, forget. Mindset. Mindset, right, right. Yeah. Um, the release of that book and its splash and success definitely, as I alluded to at the beginning of this, it definitely updated my mind a little bit about what was possible in the world of random weirdos on the internet, self-publishing essentially. And it was, so it was one of the many things that really made me start to think seriously that actually my career in academia was not really worth it and, and that that was not the best way to invest myself in a, a long-term intellectual life. It was because of, you know, people like BAP having the success that they're having. And so, I mean, that's probably the greatest compliment I, I can pay is that I, I kind of took it quite seriously. I took the, I took these interesting, weird, successful self-publishing ventures over the past few years said like, okay, I can do that. And in fact, if I invest myself in it over, you know, the, the next few decades of my kind of prime intellectual life, then, uh, hell, I could probably even do better than I'm doing in academia in terms of long-term impact. So it was people like BAP who really helped me kind of see that and have some confidence in that, in that wager. And, uh, yeah, so I'm utterly convinced that people are going to see that more and more and that we're just at the beginning of that. So, yeah, I think you're going to see, I think you are going to see more and more of this kind of thing, frankly. Yeah, and not all of it will be good. Some of it will be even okay. better. Um, but I do recommend Bronze Age Mindset as a sort of uh, challenge to yourself. Um, it's kind of like... Um, going to CrossFit, like the point of CrossFit is not to imbibe new sets of knowledge mm. that you can talk, talk about in idle chatter to other people. It's not to acquire a, a credible new set of virtue signals that can increase your prestige among some little political peer group. It's to train yourself, to train your, your brain, and to expose it to a, a mix of ideas, some of which are good, some of which are terrible, some of which are offensive and just see what are you made of can you mm. can you handle not the truth but can you handle like a weird mix of of truth and half truth and and bullshit and and shit testing and and all of that so i think it it fulfills that function very very well i'll i'll express a somewhat dissenting opinion here in saying that i don't think i'd really recommend it to anyone personally because the truth is, like, when it first came out, I, I read most of it, but I, I found it pretty hard to get through. Like, I was really kind of forcing myself to get through it as an artifact of, of you know, the cultural moment, and I wanted to understand it. But I didn't really enjoy reading it, and I didn't, I don't think I took that much away from it, frankly. Again, I'm, I hope it's clear I'm not throwing shade, because we're talking about it, you know, and I'm, I'm being quite generous in, in everything I'm saying. I'm a fan of the project in, as a whole, but... As a book, I mean, it's got some interesting stuff for sure. It's funny. It's 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 intriguing. But I found it quite hard to get through. Is the honest truth? Yeah, and by my by me saying like it's good, don't quote me on like oh no, Miller supports everything BAP says sure. in the book. Absolutely not. Like at least half of it, I would vehemently disagree with. So don't imagine I'm some BAP worshiping groupie. But I did find, like, I was skeptical when I picked it up and I bought it, but I actually got through it basically in one sitting. Like, mm -hmm. I just kind of plowed through it. I found it pretty um, gripping and energizing, and I thought, most of the way through, maybe like you did, why aren't I doing more stuff like this? Yeah, it's useful in that regard, because it's it, it is kind of crappy in some obvious ways, and that's very, you know, liberating and inspiring, because you're like, mm -hmm. oh, this guy wrote this good book that doesn't even have good grammar, and look at the splash that it's made and so that as I, as I said a very useful and welcome kind of you know cultural uh product to, to share with all of us but um yeah if you're smart and like in, and you're like fairly well read in philosophy or science uh you you probably find it like kind of a boring slog about like halfway through at least i think maybe some people will actually enjoy it i think the real target market honestly is for people who are fairly ed like like you know, they, they can read a book, right? But they're not that smart. They're not that educated. And most of what's available to read is just like kind of left-wing, kind of like uh, boring stuff, right? Because most of academia, most of the outputs have a kind of progressive, implicit kind of uh, progressive uh, kind of uh, set of 
set of presuppositions. And so like, I think there's just a, there's a market out there of people who are smart enough to read and, you know, uh, a short book, but almost nothing that's currently being published is of any interest to their actual desires and, and tendencies. And so if you're that person, then uh, yeah, you should read it. You probably like it. <laughs> yeah. So if nothing else, I think it's um, inspiring for you guys out there watching or listening to recognize there are uncolonized spaces out there. There's, there are wild spaces. Glory is out there. Go seize it. Hell yeah. That's a really nice way of putting it, Jeffrey. Could I really quick uh, plug sure. my thing? Yeah. yeah do, so do your plug. I'm working on a big project right now, which actually is quite apropos to this conversation in some sense. Uh, I'm essentially building a small startup in some sense. I'm going slow and it's just a kind of uh, experiment. We'll see where it goes. But I have a handful of users already on board. And so I'm only now starting to slowly share some details with people uh, in the world. I'm not like doing a big publicity push or anything like that, but when I do record things, I'm, I'm now mentioning it to people, so I'm just putting it out there. I am building a private community for serious and focused independent intellectuals on the internet, essentially, because uh, ever since I started you know, doing my own self-publishing and being really open and honest on the internet, a, a, a lot of people really now co contact me on a regular basis who are interested in doing creative intellectual work, but they're you know, they're serious, smart, kind of highbrow people. They don't want to just be like an average YouTuber making like crap videos. They want to do serious intellectual projects. They, like they want to do research and they want to have some kind of impact. And um, they don't know how to do it. So they ask me questions or they just want someone to talk with. They want some kind of encouragement or support or whatever. I, I get a, a bunch of different types of kind of requests from a bunch of people all over different pockets of the internet. And I, it basically became clear to me that I, I should do something with this or for these people or, and for myself also, cause I'm trying to figure it out as I go too. So I had a bunch of, uh, I talked with a bunch of people and thought about it for quite some time. And I decided that this was the best way to do it. So starting even just yesterday, I think, um, it's the first time I put anything out in public about it. Uh, you can now have a look if you want, there's not much there, but there is a landing page. There's a, a simple start of a website that is called indie thinkers. You can just search for indiethinkers.org. And uh, that will be the name of it. That will be the project. It's going to be a private community. It will be a paid thing in part because it is, you know, this is essentially a business plan, but um, I'm going to find a way to make it affordable and accessible to different types of people and different kind of use cases. And yeah, it's going to be all the best independent intellectuals on the internet trying to figure out how to do this better and how to help each other, how to teach each other and how to uh, kind of support and encourage each other, hold each other accountable or whatever. And uh, yeah, so it's a bit of a kind of startup idea. It is a business model on, on my end. That's what I'm trying to do with it. But I'm going to be over the next few months, I'm going to be giving like a lot of effort. I'm going to be giving my all really to essentially serving everyone in there and building up a community that works really well for all these different types of people who are trying to figure out this new space. And so that's the idea. And uh, indie thinkers, you can uh, request an invitation. It will be invitation only, but you know, tell me about yourself. You can request an invitation and I'll, I'll hit you up when, if and when the time is right for um, your type of person to, to join us. Yeah, I'll be onboarding people kind of slowly over time in a, in a careful way to make the, everything work for everyone involved. So thanks for letting me uh, share that on your, on your channel, Jeffrey. No problem. Oh, so I think this will go on my podcast too, right? Just, yeah. just let people know. Uh, yeah. so if it's too hard to listen to on YouTube, uh, the audio will be on my podcast, the Other Life podcast. So you can uh, listen to it in your pocket or while you're getting really jacked in the gym and, you know, pursuing your vital life forces. Uh, if you'd rather listen to this that way, uh, yeah, the other life podcast, you can find it wherever you get your podcast, just search for it. Totally. So glory is out there. Seize it. How do you get the ships and wagons and weapons to go seize it? Subscribe to Justin's business model. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're too shy. Actually, you're going to have a paperback coming out soon. You should mention that very relevant to the BAP crowd, I think. Oh, yeah. So I published this book, Virtue Signaling, a collection of essays about kind of Darwinian politics and free speech. And it's been out as an ebook for a couple months, but we've got the paperback sorted out. It's got a cover. It's got a PDF. It is currently under review at Amazon KDP, and hopefully they'll approve it and it'll be released within a couple of days. So I'll um, share about that on social media also. Cool. I think that's all we got for now, right? Thanks for watching, guys. And thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me on your channel, Jeffrey. It was fun. Sure. Always.